uh, and so this week, as we look at the next, uh, at how he takes us deeper, uh, we are going to take a look at uh, a big word called justified, that he justifies us. Now, um, then the week after, we're going to take a look at the word sanctified. So we've got a lot of fides in here. Um, we've got a lot of uh, words that we seem to pass out in the church and and particularly in the holiness denomination with the word sanctified, and so we're going to take a look at that. But always remember that, that, um, that semantics, that, that uh, our language changes down through the years. And so um, I was asked one time how often I preached on holiness. I said to the person, um, I, I preach on holiness every week. And, uh, and they said to me automatically, they said, you mean to tell me that you use the word holiness in every one of your sermons, sanctified and justified? How often do you use those? And I said, relatively never. And then they said, why? They're biblical terms. And I said, they are not biblical terms because I reminded this leader of our church that the Bible was not made and did not exist uh, in the early days, in Jesus' days, and, and thereafter, um, until 16, whatever it was, uh, in English. And so we did not have, so I do not go by the, the terms that way back there in the Greek and in the, in the Hebrew, but I, but I try to uh, to to preach holiness in every way. Um, because God has called us to be a holy people. He has called that. Now, whether, whether or not you hear certain words that would take you back to wherever, um, we try to make it to where we understand, we not only know, but we understand what those words mean. And so we have broken that down. But anyway... It's a long explanation for the title of the message this morning, and it is justified, that we are justified by faith. And uh, Romans says this, we have now been justified by Jesus' blood, and the judgment followed one sin, Adam, and brought condemnation. But the gift, Christ's death, followed many trespasses and brought justification. And the result of one act of righteousness, Christ's sacrifice on the cross, was justification that brings life to all men. But where, what does the word justification mean? How, well, how do we break it down? What does it mean inside of the church? Well, it means that it is a word that means just as if I'd never sinned. In other words... When the blood of Jesus Christ is applied to my life, I've asked forgiveness and God so freely grants forgiveness for the things that I've done. Then he applies that to our life. The blood of Jesus Christ is applied to our life and our lives are just as if I'd never sinned. I wish I could have thought of that. I wish I could have copied that, copyrighted that because... I would probably be a very rich man by now, but I didn't think of that on my own, if you can believe that. The blood of Jesus removed us from judgment by covering our sins. Jesus, in other words, made the sins of our life go away. And because the blood of Jesus, I've been made right with God. And here's how people use justify online. I found phrases like this. The end doesn't justify the means. In other words, your objective doesn't make your methods right. Or, another phrase says, how can you justify what you've done? You need to show me that what you did was the right thing to do. You've heard those before. They are saying, I am justified when I can prove that what I've done is the right thing. Uh, in fact, that's the word justify is used even in math class. Now, believe it or not, I was not a math scholar. 
But you remember when they ask you to justify your answer. One of the problems I had was, in senior algebra especially, was one of the problems was not getting the right answer. That was pretty easy. All I had to do was look at somebody else's paper, and I would get the right answer. But then they had a trick. They said, you have to justify your answer. And I didn't like that. And neither does anybody else. Because people struggle with the concept of justification because they know there is a right answer, but they don't like that right answer or how to justify it. Now, or they don't want to. And because of that, they can't justify what they've done in their own lives. Uh, illustration in Parade Magazine, there were comments like these about cheating from teenagers. Now, these were from teenagers. We wouldn't cheat, of course. Nobody cheats on their taxes. Nobody does anything like that. Nobody cheats on their husband. Nobody cheats on their wife. It is all well and good. So here's some of the things that were said by teenagers who haven't learned yet. Jason, age 16, said, Cheating is not okay if there is a victim, as in cheating in a relationship. Cheating is morally wrong, but schools put a lot of pressure on students to succeed, and they don't always look at the student's effort. I only cheat in school and not in anything else. So he was justifying his fact that he cheated in school, but nowhere else. He wouldn't cheat on his girlfriend or his friend. He would not do that. He was justifying his actions. The second thing, Will, age 15, said, cheating is okay as long as you don't get caught. <laughs> I'm a pretty average student with generally B pluses and A minuses. I wonder where he would be if he didn't cheat. When I come home, if I'm tired, I won't study for a test the next day. Teachers are so stupid, you can just lay a book on the floor open to the right page. I'd like to know where this guy went to school because I would have went there myself. Do you see what these kids were doing? They're just justifying their actions. They're justifying those. But theirs was a different kind of justification. They knew they were not supposed to cheat, but they did. They can't justify their actions based on what they know is right to do, so they move the goalposts. They create an excuse or a justification for what they have done. For why should they be allowed to cheat? They've been up too late to study. The, the school doesn't judge them on effort, but on performance, on what they do. And so they're justified by cheating. So they create a new standard of right and wrong. I'm just wondering if we have done that. As Americans, have we done that? That we just kind of move the goalpost of, uh, and, and we say that, hey, it's okay to do certain things. For example, now I read a bumper sticker years ago, and years ago this just struck me to my core. It said that we have killed 50 million, 50 million children through abortion. 50 million people have been killed by the act of abortion. And yet, I believe that it is the one thing that has escaped the church of today that we say very little about the act of abortion anymore. I remember back in the day, why just 20 years ago, it was the hot topic. But now the hot topic is no longer abortion. We have moved on from that. And we act as if it's just water off a duck's back anymore. But I want to tell you, God does not move the goalpost. He does not. No matter how we justify that, He does not move the goalpost. He just doesn't. Um, I remember seeing a cartoon years ago where the character shot an arrow at the wall 
And then he went up to the wall and he painted the target around the arrow. And lo and behold, he had a bullseye on it. So I am asking you, have we moved where the bullseye is in our Christian walk? Sometimes we have thought that everything is okay and everything is justifiable because the grace of God will intervene in our lives. But I want to ask you, have we cheapened the grace of God by resetting where the, the final goal is? That's what uh, those kids were doing. Romans 3.23 says, tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, one of the things we have to realize is, is that there are a few definitions of sin. First of all, there is the definition of sin that says we miss the mark. That is where some individuals say that we, have, um, that we sin every day in word, thought, and deed. And if that were the case, then, um, then, that, then that would probably be true if we, if we said that sin was just missing the mark. In other words, I want to ask you, do you give 100%, not asking you, Chuck, do you give 100% to absolutely everything that you do? No downtime, nothing. You give 100% to your marriage, you give 100% to your work, you give, I mean, you never take a break, you never do any of that. Well, that would be missing the mark. But we don't believe that, you see. We believe that sin is a willful transgression against the known law of God. In other words, we willfully, when we know what is right to do, we willfully do not do it. Or we leave it out in our life. That is what we are held accountable to. So when the Bible says we have all fallen short of the glory of God, it is that second thing that I mentioned. It is the second way of sinning. We have all stuck our fist in the face of God and have said, you are not going to rule me. I will rule myself. I will make my own rules. I will justify what I am doing. Regardless of what you say. Now, everybody has failed the test. Now this creates a problem for most people because we don't like failing. But we do sin. We fall short. We mess up, etc. Deep inside us, it bugs us to realize we're never really going to get to the point where we can justify ourselves before God. I mean, can you imagine? I've thought to myself what it would be like in, in, as God looks at me and I look at him on that great judgment day. Can you imagine me saying, well, you know, God, you don't know the circumstances I had. You, you don't understand what, what it meant to be in that group. and You don't understand the pressures that I've been under. You don't understand that my therapist has messed up and not told me the right thing to do. You just don't understand. Can you imagine what that must sound like in, in God's ears? It might, must sound like just like my children when they would mess up. And they would give me some excuse to justify why they did what they did. It just sounds like a bunch of... Bee, 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 bee. <laughs> That's scriptural right there. <laughs> you and I are never going to get the point where we can justify ourselves before an almighty God. And the reason why is because God not only knows what we do with the actions that we have, He knows exactly why we did them. It's not only that we've come to church, you guys. It's that we wanted to. We were compelled to. 
We had to get with the group of individuals, believers in Jesus Christ. We had to. We just had to. He knows our motivations, the motivations of his heart, but uh, of our hearts, but that kind of, well, it frustrates us a little bit. Because it throws us off balance. Years ago, one pastor said this, years ago I knew a young man who worked in a factory. It was a noisy place and they required the workers to have earplugs. Then some company got right, uh, br the bright idea of pouring liquid gel into people's ears to form a custom-fitting earplug. Sounds like a good idea, doesn't it? Well, not for this young man. Something went terribly wrong and the process damaged his inner ear. Probably a suit followed that. Do you know what happens when you damage your inner ear? You lose your balance. This man couldn't walk. He was nauseated all the time. His inner ear was damaged and threw off his inner ear balance. Now, the Bible tells us we have a moral inner ear. It's called our conscience. I believe that it is the first working of the Holy Spirit. Our conscience. People would say, how do I know something is wrong? I want to tell you, it's your conscience. I mean, it hounds you day and night. It gets on you. It, it drives you insane. When you have an unforgiving spirit, it's your conscience that drives you, moves you, say, and keeps pestering you and saying, you have to make it right. You have to make it right. You have. And then finally, there's a point in time where we can sever our conscience. Where we harden ourselves. We can't fix things on our own. Our conscience can get damaged and it can throw us off. It will unbalance our lives because we can't justify our own lives. Now, people handle this reality in two ways. First of all, they either, they either move the goalpost, as I've already mentioned. They redefine normal or they try to balance things out by compensating. Uh, they try to do enough good things for God, and they compensate the bad things that they've already done. They're still a little off balance, but they feel better about themselves. In other words, they make a deal with God. God, I know that I did something, whatever it was, cheated on the test, but God, I'll go to church for the next five weeks. So they have one bad tick mark, which is a big one, but the five cancel the others. It doesn't work like that. It's kind of like now they have crutches and they can at least be fairly normal, but even when they convince themselves that that's not working, there's still this nagging doubt, this underlying discomfort that they can't line up their morality with the righteous they know they should be doing. If there's only one magical way of, to line up their lives with what we know is right, a way of lining things up so that even when we don't do what is right, we still could find peace within our heart. That's what Romans 5 is all about. It's all about God lining ourselves up with His righteousness, not our own. We can't justify ourselves, you guys. We are dead in the water. We are sitting ducks. Whatever adjective, whatever, whatever uh, cliche you want to add there, you can add it. But we are dead in our trespasses and sin. But there is only one way, and that is through the blood of Jesus Christ. We have now been justified by His blood, Romans 5, 9. And the judgment followed one sin, Adam's. And brought condemnation, but the gift, Christ's death, followed many trespasses and brought justification. And the results of one act of righteousness, Christ's sacrifice, was justification that brings life for all men. By that one act of righteousness, we have been made as if we had never sinned through the blood of Jesus Christ. 
I was looking at terms and ways that we justify. I found the world actually uses the word that God does in Romans. And there is a setting where justify means to make it so that everything lines up as it should. Now, uh, in my office I have a wonderful thing. In fact, I don't even know where I would be if it were not for a computer. Now notice, um, I've asked Brian to, uh, to line this up. Now, now go ahead, Brian, show. Okay, so if you look at this here, let me try to get over here. Sorry. Okay. Okay, look at this. This is called justifying, justifying your text. I'm a computer whiz. When a text is not justified, the edges are ragged. Look at, look at how this side is all justified. Now, this other side is, is ragged. In other words, it's not justified. It's not, it's not perfectly um, within margin. It's just, kind of, it's just kind of out there. Now, go to the next slide, Brian, if you could. Now, look at this. This is awesome. Look at this. Now, if you got this like you would on some papers, you would say to yourself, this is no good. But when it, and so this side now is unjustified, but this side is perfectly normal. Or it's perfect. Uh, do we have one more, Brian? Hallelujah. Look at this baby. When a text is not justified, the edges are ragged. In the same way, when our lives are not justified, at least one part of our lives is going to show the raggedness of sin. It is this raggedness that causes people to experience nagging doubt and discomfort. You see that? Now, what about the people on this side? They might not get it. <laughs> you guys are the unjustified ones over here. <laughs> Look at how this lines up. Isn't that great? Look at it. It's just beautiful. Look at it. It's just beautiful. Both sides are perfectly lined up. Perfectly. Well, not perfectly. But pretty doggone close. I know, I'm not sure. I hear a lot of kids these days, or a lot of people, I guess I should say, saying perfect. And I'm always, my response is always the same. No, there's nothing perfect except for God. And so this is not a perfect situation. And so I try to educate individuals when they say perfect, perfect, everything's perfect, perfect. That and yeah, 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 yeah. Here's what I want to say. All that it takes in my office is punching one single key to justify both the right side and the left side. Where we're not jagged on one part of it or on one side of our life and then on the other side of our life we are justified. Let me give you an example of that. We all look good coming to church, man. All of us do. We are, we look good. Most of us smell good. Most of us don't wear our PJs in. Most of us, our hair isn't sticking up all over like mine does in the morning. My wife looked at me yesterday after a wedding that I did and, and I was out in the car and she said, what's the matter with you? And I said, I don't know why. She said, your hair, have you seen your hair? I said, no, I haven't seen my hair. So I looked in the mirror and it was all over the place. I wasn't justified. I was windified, that's exactly right.
But you see, all it takes is one single stroke of a button that could justify what has happened on both sides. To take the ragged edges away. I want to tell you that there is only one single way, one single moment that in the blink of an eye that God can justify just as if you had never sinned ever in your life, ever. And that is by the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for you on Calvary and the resurrected Lord that gave you power to live above all sin. You have been justified one single action. Hallelujah. Isn't that awesome? It was a computer that did it. But did you know that newspapers and books you can get at the library, they don't do any of that. Do you know it's called, what it's called when you do that? It's called justifying the text. Everything lines up perfectly. Purists say it looks neater and it creates a perfect shape and is easier to read. With just a few strokes of the keys of a computer, that can happen. Now my point is this. Even on my computer, I find that the world around me understands what justification means. Justification is when all signs line up. It's the raggedness that overwhelms us and overwhelms us with the feeling of imbalance. In other words, you know what I have found out about the world? That even the world doesn't like a hypocrite. Even the world doesn't like a hypocrite. You're welcome. Not even the world likes a hypocrite. The, the, the person that's unsaved doesn't like a hypocrite. The person that, that, that goes to church on Sunday but then acts like the devil on Monday, not even the world likes that. Why is that? Because they're justified on Sunday, they're unjustified on Monday. And so we have to be consistent in our walk. We'll hit that when we hit that the, the people of this world need to be righteous in their walk. The raggedness that overwhelms individuals is when we're one way one, sometimes and another way another time. That we're perfectly fine when all eyes are on us. But we're not that way at home. Um, so he did it for us. He stepped into our world and justified the margins of our life so that we could be justified in walking this earth. You know what I have found though? is that a lot of times we don't walk in the freedom of that justification. We walk in condemnation of before we were justified. Now, I don't know about you, but I know for me that if I was convicted, let's say, of a crime, and I went before a judge, and the judge ruled me not guilty, I wouldn't say, now wait a minute. I should be guilty. I wouldn't say that. Man, I would walk out of that courtroom and say, hallelujah. Because I have been made and set free instead of where I'm at now. And all of a sudden when he says not guilty, it means not guilty. I don't, I don't question that. I don't, I don't say, hey, you know, you made a wrong decision on this. I am out of there as quick as I can. Um, okay, so one time we were in Orlando, Florida, and uh, I, I, I was in a little hurry to get there, and, and so I, um, well, 
I got pulled over for speeding. Me and about 10 other people. And so my mother-in-law and father-in-law were with me, and so I had to make up an excuse and say, hey, I wasn't speeding. So anyway, um, we had to, and they caught me by the helicopter up top that I never saw. I thought that was unfair. It's not right. They caught me from the helicopter up top, and, and so I, I went into court, and uh, they said, now you can contest this ticket. And so somebody told me that I needed to contest tickets. So I decided, hi there, um, I decided that what I would do is contest the ticket. And so um, I, that's what I did. So I went into the courtroom, and... What I found out was they called the police officer forward. He came up there, but he was not the police officer that gave me the ticket. The police officer that gave me the ticket was the guy up in the air, and they were waiting for him to come. The judge then said to me, well, the guy, we had our case. We, we had it down. We had what we were going to do. My father-in-law, he made me out a big, big, uh, uh, board and it said how fast I was going and what I what I could have averaged and what I didn't average and all that stuff and how long it took us and <laughs> it was it was malarkey really <laughs> so anyway the judge says is officer so and so no we're waiting is he here and they said no we're waiting on him right now and he said is he here and they said no and he said, the court cannot wait any longer. I pronounce you not guilty. <laughs> you know what I did, honestly? Because we had our case all lined out. We had our justification all lined out. I wanted to argue the point that he was wrong in giving me the ticket in the first place. And my father-in-law literally grabbed me by the back of the shirt and he said, are you absolutely nuts? He just ruled that you're not guilty. Let's get out of here. <laughs> I didn't have wisdom then at all. But I did listen to him and finally decided, well, we'll get out of here without being heard. In fact, the judge said to me, do you understand what I have just ruled and you want to argue that point? I said, no, sir, I don't. So I walked out of there a free man. My point is this. If the sun has set you free... If the sun has set you free, if the sun has set you free, you are free indeed. God has wiped out the past. He has cast your sin as far as the east is from the west. And he has justified you. And you start with a blank slate just as if you have never sinned. You have been justified. You've been justified. And he did it with one stroke of the computer. That's all it took. It was a tremendous price. But he did it in the blink of an eye. I want to close with the words of a song by Matthew West. Hello, my name is Regret. I'm pretty sure we have met. Every single day of your life, I'm the whisper inside you that won't let you forget. Hello, my name is Defeat. I know you recognize me. Just when you think you can win, I'll drag you right back down again till you've lost all belief. Oh, these are the voices. Oh, these are the lies. And I have believed them for the very last time. That's how life is without Jesus. Regret, defeat, and constant doubting of God's love for me. 
But once God has justified us, once the blood of Jesus has covered our sins, that changes. Hello. My name is a child of the one true king. I've been saved. I've been changed. I have been set free. Amazing grace is the song I sing. Hello, my name is the child of the one true king. I am no longer defined by all the wreckage behind. The one who makes all things new has proven it true. Just take a look at my life. What love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called the children of God. I am a child of the one true King. What love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called His children. My point is simply this. This isn't about church attendance or church membership. This is about realizing what God has done for you. Neither you nor I can ever justify ourselves. God did it for us. And if we do sin, God has an answer for that as well. Listen to what it says. And if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The key thing to remember is this. You will never be righteous enough to, ab and to be able to justify yourself by a holy God. But God has made you holy by the, His own blood. He paid the price. We can't justify anything we do. Sorry. We'd like to. We did it as kids. We did it, do it as humans. We do it as adults. We do it as teenagers. We do it... All the time we justify the wrongdoings of ourselves instead of just saying, Lord, I'm sorry, can you please forgive me? Or saying that to somebody else, we will do all kinds of things to justify what we have done. And I want to tell you, Jesus Christ is the only justification for our sin. Heart on fire